is probably fifty percent reduction. Yes. And just sort of point that out. Yeah, that's in there. That's in that book. And you could. I mean, oh, I remember you could add the Brooklyn photo to the Brooklyn. You could like. Yeah. 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 Sunday, I thought I was getting home from the entire booster, but I only went to camp. They were, they were very strange. Strange. Probably just like yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I drafted, I drafted a footprint that and, and, would do and it by mean. a special permit yeah. process. Uh -huh. And I was fiddling with tying it to the stretch energy code, you know, sort of making it an incentive for going beyond the stretch energy code. And Mike Yanovich um, said, you know, this is going to raise all sorts of enforcement issues because, you know, if, if we make a ruling on it, that gets appealed to the DDRC and the Zoning Board of Appeals gets appealed to somewhere else. And, you know, don't, we got to figure out how to do So I said, okay, this is just not. You could tie it to the next edition of the building code. So, yeah, and, and actually then the building code has been revised and it's a different, you know, it's no longer. But that's it. They were just the 2009. It's now the 2012. I, I was just proving I read it. I saw she knows about my. Yeah, I'm glad. I didn't know. Good area. I mean, so what did you think about the meeting? Just to clarify, the district meeting was a good. Or in a broad sense, good. It's just one of the sort of. Waterfall it through. Right. Tier three. Right. You're, you're telling yeah. me that I should have stopped there when the first grade. No, no, no. You could continue that to the fourth grade. Right. Well, you eventually got Because what they have done, what they have done in their analysis is they have assumed oh, so. sure. there are 30 classrooms and that those carry through one, two, three, four, five. They carry them all the way through. So you're just saying no, like, if you start with 26, 26 carry them all the way through. That's, which is an entirely, an entirely appropriate oh. analysis. I mean, my, my only point is that when you get to the fourth grade, you would actually have more right. I mean, you, you might be able to do it some more. Are we still waiting for the okay. classroom? No, the middle is in the top five. Yeah, right. So we've got to do it. Where there are some other things you're right. And I was the I did, when I did the analysis of the 2012 2013 classes, I didn't have the middle you could take the kids out of the middle of the name comes up often. <laughs>
they got pets. So that was perfect. perfect. Yeah. I thought you would sit there, but I didn't know. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. you know, at the last minute, like at you know 5:30, I said, "Oh, let me go onto the town's website and see." And it's at seven. And I said, "Nice." And I went back to my notes, and I didn't see anything. And I had three of us came at six. six. We're about Bev, yeah. Janet, and me, and we're saying, "Where is everybody?" I, I, um, I thought, okay, I'm totally, you know, I, I a mess up. I, I didn't, I just, I didn't, I don't I haven't either, but I have found that I think that it's in a certain, whatever meeting I'm in is in a certain room. And so, that's why. But I would have called. Oh, they went around. Uh, oh, we should put them on. Sorry, there. Yeah. The names. I bet they're there. Yeah, they are. Go around and it was like go around where they stop. And I just no, can't find it. it. No, no, that makes me feel much better. Oh, you have yours. I'm looking for yours. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to because the file had come by earlier. Oh, I see. This is its second loop. And uh, I pulled out. I pulled Hi. Out. Good, thank you. Hi, how are you? It was good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, it has lots of information. You can understand that. Right. Yeah, I'm one of these editors where it's like, unless if it's like, if you, <laughs> if you have a preference for style, I'm going to just see if it's preference. I don't really care. I mean, like, I feel like I'm, I don't know, partly because I, I don't feel super about my, uh, my grammar. I, boy, I don't. And then I saw this. Was there an email that said that this was at 7? I thought there was. Then I would say about two thirds of people knew it was, and a third didn't, so it makes me feel like there was. I mean, a lot, there, was, there were so many that were flying around, so which is why I tried to pull something together. But, but, um, <laughs> No, that's just insane. I, my wife's sister died on. Uh, yeah, it's been a while coming. Unfortunately, nothing came back to me. One or the other. So. That's usually good. Yeah. Hi. I don't see Jim. So I, I'm, I was I'm appreciating you know, you're on I was already behind. No way that I don't feel like yeah. I'm Presentation. Okay, whatever the Tomorrow reason. Tomorrow evening, that I <laughs> haven't even started thinking about. I'm giving it. Shall I get the water? 30 seconds. Right. We come to order. Carol, there's a coffee. Give me a talk at the University of Art? Waterloo. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. It's in Ontario. It's Ontario. It's not far from Toronto. How was your trip? What were you doing in Israel? Were you in Israel? Friday. And it needs to be updated relative to the last time I did it. Was this? I usually have it done before I get on the plane, unless it's an international flight, and then it's mostly done. international, but it's really not. Right. Good or? Of course. Um, right. Shall we come to order? <laughs> okay. Um, why don't we come to order? Um, the uh, minutes of uh, November 6th uh, will not be voted on today. Um, I just want to note that um, there is a list of upcoming meetings that I've put together as best I could from the emails that have been flying around and uh, the town's calendar and um, uh, 
if there are any corrections, any changes, any omissions to that, uh, just send Susan and me an email and uh, we can update it and get it out. But what I was trying to do was to get them in some kind of chronological order uh, with, to the extent uh, that they've been identified at this point, the topics that are going to be discussed at each of the subcommittee meetings uh, so that if uh, members of the override study committee who are not members of a particular subcommittee have an interest in a particular topic, they will know what's going on, when it's going on, and uh, um, uh, have the opportunity to attend and, and uh, follow what is happening in the other subcommittees. And, and just to state the obvious, while it's important to let Dick and I know, it's also really important to let Sean and Melissa know because um, then it gets onto the website. So there's, you can also, if you're, if for whatever reason you're stuck on the website, these should all be there also. Okay. Thank you. Sergio. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, remind my colleagues that there is a new document that's been put up on our website, which is called the Brookline High School Concept Study that was carried out just two months ago, September of 2013, which takes a more careful look at the implications of the student enrollment issues at the high school. And I remind you that B-Space, as you know, was fundamentally dealing with the K through 8. So this document is actually a very critical document in many ways, and it addresses a very significant financial component of the larger problem that we're dealing with. So I want you to make sure that you have an opportunity that you know it's there, and I recommend that you take a chance to look at it. Thanks. So the main item uh, for tonight's uh, agenda is um, an examination of um, the uh, operating uh, side of uh, the town's budget. Uh, we've talked about the capital issues to some extent. You've had an overview of that. The uh, subcommittees, uh, in, including particularly the capital subcommittee, is delving into uh, those capital issues. Uh, but um, uh, the operating uh, budget forecasts were put aside, and uh, this meeting uh, is being uh, devoted to, or at least certainly focusing on uh, the operating budget issues. So I know that there's a presentation from Sean and a presentation from Peter. Um, who is going first, town or Sean. school? Sean is going first. Great. So what I'm going to do is walk through um, the so-called structural deficit portion, and then Peter will uh, take it from there in terms of what enrollment growth has meant or will mean uh, for the school budget. So what this basically is is a much condensed uh, presentation than what we normally give the selectmen in December, which is our long-range financial forecast. It's a lot more slides, a lot more numbers, but we figured we'd keep it nice and simple uh, for tonight. So. Let me just start with some of the assumptions uh, that, we, that we use in here. I'll just walk through each of these uh, pretty quickly. Um, clearly, we, we go to the maximum on our levy limit. If you remember, um, on Prop 2.5, you can increase your levy 2.5% each year. You don't have to. Um, Brookline historically has, and I, I assume that continues. Um, and then within property tax, if, if you remember what's called new growth, which is basically new construction for the most part, um, we have a base estimate in there of about 1.7 million, but to that, in fiscal 16 and 17, we add uh, the projected new growth from the Red Cab project, the Red Cab site on Route 9, and to Brookline Place. Um, and you'd see that Red Cab is worth about $325,000 in both uh, 16 and 17, so 650 total for those two year periods, and all these numbers come from Economic Development and our Assessor's Office. Two Brookline Place, um, once it's fully um, built out, would be almost $2 million in property tax growth. But for fiscal 17, it's projected to be $460,000. Um, also related to the Red Cab site, there's, um, that's supposed to be a new hotel. So with that comes the lodging tax. Um, and the estimate for that in fiscal 17 is $200,000. So all of those 
uh, baked into these uh, figures. And then a, this is probably the biggest guess of any that's in this presentation, what our growth in state aid is going to be. Uh, chapter 70, if you recall, is the uh, state's program for uh, local education. Um, this has been, over the last two years, pretty generous to Brookline because of a formula change at the state level a few years ago that they finally start, started to fund. Um, what this does, for those of you who know the formula, and I'm not one of them, um, is it gets the town closer to the magic 17.5% figure, which is Chapter 70 supposed to be um, a minimum of 17.5% of a local community's foundation budget. So this gets us another point closer to that. I, I'm not assuming we get there in one fell swoop, uh, but I'm assuming a million dollars, which gets us um, basically halfway from where we are um, today. On the expenditure side, health insurance rate increases of 5% in fiscal 15 and 15, and then 6% in 16 and 17. Um, those are actually lower than what you know, the years past. We used to assume 8 or 9 or 10%. Um, but the last few years, uh, we realized increases of 2, 3, and 4 percent, so um, we're starting at a lower, a lower point. Unfortunately, we don't know that number until um, the first week of March, so um, there'll be no movement on that um, until then. Um, also, continued growth in health insurance enrollment for two reasons. One, new teachers, and two, um, the second piece is that as we have um, town and school employees retire, uh, more often than not, the positions are backfilled, so you have another person added to the health insurance rolls. Um, we have annual increase in special education budget of $750,000, which is split according to the town school partnership, which I'll get to toward the end. Um, another big assumption is collective bargaining. Um, neither the town side nor the school side have contracts in place for fiscal, f I shouldn't say that. Some of the town unions have contracts in for 15, but uh, police and fire do not. Um, and on the school side, they don't either. Um, so I'm assuming 2% in, in, in all of the years. Um, and then what's there in parentheses is the school's fiscal 15 figure includes a half a million dollars from what we call the tail from the fiscal 14 contract. That, and Peter can speak to it um, if there's questions about it. But basically, there's a number of items on the last day of the contract that have a zero payout in fiscal 14. Instead, the payout's in fiscal 15. So right out of the chute, even if there was a zero in fiscal 15, there's a half $550,000 of commitments to it. Um, we continue to fund our OPEB schedule. Um, uh, well, uh, while it's not mandatory, we take great pride in what we've been doing there, and that's an annual increase of a quarter of a million dollars. Um, no changes in our pension schedule. For those of you who um, sat through those discussions we've had on pensions so far, you know that this uh, schedule is basically locked in place for two years, fiscal 14 and fiscal 15. Uh, so these numbers are baked in that as well. And then lastly, we continue to follow our 6% CIP policy. So those are the major assumptions that are uh, built in to the projections. So very quickly, um, these are changes. These aren't total dollar. All of these slides are the delta from year to year. And I note at the bottom that free cash is not including the projections because all it does is mess up the numbers and it all goes to one-time items anyway. So in terms of what does it mean for the operating budget, nothing. So I, I zeroed it out as you see it at the bottom. Um, so just going through these uh, again pretty quickly, uh, you'll see that our major revenue um, is property tax, the growth um, anywhere between six to seven, seven and a half million dollars a year. Again, fully go to the levy and those um, additional new growth items that we had talked about all baked in there. Um, local receipts, um, this is where I believe the Revenue Subcommittee is going to um, challenge our assumptions, and that's, that's great. Um, they're going to look back at um, over time for the last X number of years. Um, we admit we're conservative, but we want to be safe rather than sorry because a revenue deficit is one of the last things you want to have in a community. Plus, it would decimate partially your CIP because free cash goes to the CIP, extra local receipts means it's free cash, which means capital. So keep that in mm -hmm. mind as you're looking at uh, local receipt estimates. Uh, but what we have here is um, for motor vehicle excise, which is the town's single largest um, local receipt, it's over $5 million, as we've been using for the last seven or eight years or so, basically a four-year moving average. Um, and what that does is take out the peaks and the valleys because it's a very volatile revenue source if you look at it over time. It's all over the place. Um, so for fiscal uh, 15, we were projecting an increase of 200,000. In the out years, it's basically a 2% uh, growth. Local op. 
just as a clarification, the, the, these three years, are they relative to the same, to, to FY14, or, or are they? Year over year change. So in other words, we're looking at $7 million increase in, in 15, another $7 million. Correct. In, okay. Yep. Um, local option taxes, again, are meals and uh, lodging. Um, for lodging, uh, we're increasing that $100,000, which has nothing to do with uh, Red Cab. That's just based upon the last few years of actuals. Um, meals, similarly, increasing that by $25,000. And then you'll see in 17, this is what I was talking about earlier with uh, assumptions from the hotel at the Red Cab site. That bumps up fiscal 17. Um, general government, the big piece right there, the 172000 is uh, building permits. Uh, that's another kind of difficult and crazy one to try to predict, so we're admittedly pretty conservative with that. Um, but even with that, we're increasing that by um, $135,000 in fiscal 15. Interest income is actually two pieces. It's um, investment on the town's cash, which is pretty much zero. Um, and then it's also interest on delinquent taxes, unpaid taxes, late taxes. Um, and the growth that you see there, the 40000 all comes from the delinquent tax side. Um, we're keeping our $250,000 investment income estimate, um, which is the lowest we've, you know, had this past fiscal year. We came in right at around two fifty. Um, I mean, we're earning nothing on our money. Um, so we, we're not increasing anything there. Uh, pilots and 121As, again, pilots are payment in lieu of taxes. And I know the finance director spoke to the revenue subcommittee in some good detail about what pilots are and how they function and how we tries to get them. Um, 121A is a old holdovers from the urban uh, redevelopment era in the 70s. Uh, those are running away. The big change you see here in 17 is a 121A coming off and then it becomes property taxes. So part of the growth in property taxes in 17 is this going away right there. Okay. And uh, refuse fee, that's the quarterly bill you get for 50 bucks a quarter. Um, we've been pulling in 2.65 million for the last three or four years, so this 50 gets us up from 2.6 to 2.65. Um, and departmental and other really is just a hodgepodge of other items. <coughs> um, the increase there is really coming from parking permits. And for those in the revenue subcommittee heard from Todd Crane about the number of different permit programs we have. State aid. Here's the million dollars in Chapter 78 I talked about. And then for 16 and 17, I just assume a 2% increase. Um, this general government aid, we're assuming no growth in 15, um, and then very limited growth in 16 and 17. And then these other available funds really don't play much into the picture here. These, are, these items down here are reimbursements from town special revenue funds to reimburse the general fund for benefits, which are accounted for in the general fund. So that's all a town side uh, thing right there. So in total, you got anywhere from, again, seven and a half to $8 million of revenue growth. And on a percentage basis, that's, you know, three, three and a half percent annually. Okay. And any questions on revenue assumptions or? Uh, what about the one-time medallion? One-time medallion, if it happens, would come in probably, I should say when it happens, will probably come in over a three-year period, and it could be, you know, 10, 12, 14 million dollars is what we're expecting. Whatever the amount is would have nothing to do with this. That's one-time money. That's something that some of us would like to see to go to unfund liabilities. Some might argue it should go to capital. Whatever it is, it's one time in nature, and it should play no role in uh, ongoing um, operating projections. Yeah, um, anyone who's done forecasting knows that you know, there's always going to be some level of error, but you have a historical experience about how, how big that is. Can you give us an idea of what your experience has been in terms of how accurate these estimates tend to be? Yeah, the, the, the biggest wild cars annually are motor vehicle excise, and we don't know that one. So here we are, what's it, um, mid-November. Um, we won't know how accurate that is until uh, February or March of 2015. And that's because you all know you get that nice bill, we all, as Massachusetts residents, get that nice bill in the mail in uh, February or March. And that's called, we call it the first commitment. And that represents about 80% of your annual motor vehicle excise bill. So that's the biggest barometer of what your motor vehicle is going to be. Um, so for this fiscal year, in 14, we won't know how accurate our estimate is until uh, February or March. 
So that's one, you know, we use a five, four year moving average, it's been pretty successful. I think we missed our bogey one year over the last few years. Um, but that will, that will swing, you know, that's, you know, that one's difficult to project. Um, local option taxes, um, those have come in over budget um, over the last three or four years. Um, probably a couple hundred thousand dollars on a base of each of them about a million dollars budgeted. Um, nothing really goes on license and permits, so those are pretty easy to project. We know how many licenses and permits we have and what the allowance are. Building permits, which is part of general government, is another um, crapshoot. Um, it's been north of two million dollars each of the last f four, five, six years. And we've been pretty conservative budgeting anywhere from one, each year we've inc we increase it. So a few years ago it was one seven, now we're up to about two million dollars. And I'm, I admit, I'm, I get worried because I know once we get hi go high on it, building permits are going to go down. Um, somebody's law, Murphy's or somebody's. Um, um, interest income, we, that's easy to project now because it's zero, basically. Um, and the, we've been doing 250 for the last two years, so there's very little wiggle room on that. But the unpaid tax side of it can vary pretty greatly, too, because we don't know how good taxpayers are going to be at paying their bills. Um, that we have seen an increase over budget the last couple of years in that one. Refuse fees, easy, 2.65 million. It's been that way for the last few years. We've been generating a fifty thousand uh, dollar budgeted uh, surplus, so to speak, on that, and that fifty gets us up. Um, and then there are a number of one-time revenues that come in during the year. And if you're interested, I can I shared with the revenue subcommittee a year-end memo I give to the town administrator and the selectmen for fiscal 13 that goes in gory detail through every single revenue item. And I have them going back for the last decade. And you can see, if you want, where we've missed. More often than not, it's been um, conservative on some of the items that tend to be impacted by the economy. Um, but more so than that, a lot of one-time items um, that, for obvious reasons, we don't, we don't budget to get reimbursed for a hurricane. We don't budget for a uh, bond premium because we're not sure when we borrow if we're actually going to get a premium or not. Um, you know, things like that, but um, I think last year the surplus was about $2 million in local receipts, give or take. Right. <coughs> um, so do, you have, do you have additional new, like a new growth estimate built in outside of the Red Cabin 2% base? Yeah, site? the base in each year is 1.7, I believe, or 1.75. <coughs> and that's been, um, new growth this year is going to be certified, hopefully this week, at, at just under $2 million. All right, and we budgeted 1.7 for it, so there's a 250 some odd thousand dollar uh, difference, there. and I would say that's been pretty much um, the figure for the last couple of years. If you go back uh, a few years ago when our new growth was off the charts, you know the, the difference there was three quarters of a million dollars, a uh, million dollars. Now it's you know a couple hundred thousand dollars, um, but so 1.7, 1.75 is what's what's built in there. All right, a little bit tougher to read, but on the um, expenditure side, again, these are changes, and I want to highlight this, and it's silly that we have it in here in our bowl, but it's really in case folks read it online without hearing it. Um, all of these figures assume no enrollment growth. Peter gets to stand up here and talk about that. So I'm living in a world of no enrollment growth on these charts up here. Um, so town departmental budgets, um, Yes. Um, I think I said that uh, that's kind of an almost made up number. It's our best guess right now. As you know, we won't know anything until the governor submits House One. Um, but what we've done over the last couple of years is we've been watching how close we get into that 17.5 figure. And each year, it's kind of grown by about 1%. So a few years ago, we were at like 13 and a half. Now we're up to about 15 and a half. So just backed into, if we got another percentage point growth to 16 and a half, what does that equate to the formula? And it's about a million dollars. So instead of saying, let's assume that the legislature goes to the full 17 and a half on a funding, which would get us well over $2 million, we're assuming just another percentage point growth. But your guess is as good, if not better, than mine as to what it will be. You know, we'll see what the governor does, and, you know, that's, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen either. So, you know, state aid is just a really difficult thing uh, to project. But for starting points, we feel somewhat comfortable 
uh, with a million dollar growth in Chapter 70. So on the expenditure side, uh, town budgets up top. Um, what we do for services, supplies, and other, and capital is basically very simply inflate them by about 2% a year. Um, as we go through the town budget process, um, we, we meet with departments individually, and we'll make some decisions. Obviously, we've got to balance our side of the budget, but for forecast purposes, we grow all of our departmental budgets and on personnel by about 2%. The personnel numbers up here, those are actually pretty straightforward. In the each of those years assumes step increases of $250,000. Um, the reason why those numbers don't say 250 is because we also have elections. And one year we'll have one election, the next year we'll have three elections, then we'll have two elections. Each election uh, cycle is worth about, um, what's it, 100 grand? 50, 50 grand per election. So in fiscal 15, we have three elections instead of one in the current fiscal year, so that's another 100,000 bucks. So it's silly things like that that we've got to kind of pay attention to when we're doing our forecast. So what you see here in the first year is 250 of steps plus $100,000 that we need for part-time election workers. And then the next year we have, I think, we go back down to one election, so it's actually decreasing. Um, so that's what we assume in our personnel budget. Collective bargaining I talked about um, already, 2% both town and school. Um, but you see here that 1 million, that odd number, 1881200, that's 2% plus the tail that we talked about from uh, the, the last day of this current fiscal year's contract. Um, schools, again, exclusive of enrollment growth, and we'll come back to this in a little bit. Those are um, special education growth of $750,000, stepped in lane adjustments, net of $750,000, and an inflation factor of about a quarter of a million dollars. Non-departmental benefits, pensions is very easy because we know our schedule, uh, so those numbers right there from our schedule. Group health, I already talked at the beginning about a 5% increase in the first year and 6% thereafter in enrollment growth. I believe 45 new enrollees in fiscal 15 um, and 30 and 16 and 30 and 17. Um, what else changed there? This is our OPEB funding schedule. The uh, plan has been $250,000 a year from the tax base. And then the difference there is um, reimbursements from non-general fund sources, re, um, enterprise funds, revolving funds, et cetera. Um, workers' comp, we like to um, keep a certain fund balance in that fund, and this will help keep us there. Um, Medicare coverage, this is one that you'll see here grows about 7% a year. Over time, it will grow by what wages grow, because once everybody is on Medicare, new employees, that will grow as wages grow. These other things are all really small. I won't even really um, spend much time on it other than non-appropriated. Again, that's the part of the budget. It's called non-appropriated because town meeting doesn't really appropriate it. They have no say in the matter. Those are things like the MBTA assessment, the county assessment, and the overlay, which is under the purview of the Board of Assessors. So you have eight and a half, well, 8.3 to $9 million of revenue of expenditure growth and that's in the 37, 36, 38 uh, range. So you take the first slide, revenue growth, second slide, expenditure growth, and you do the math. And you get a cumulative, well, you get a first year deficit of call it $650,000. Second year cumulative is 1.5, meaning add $900,000 to the first year. Third year is a cumulative de deficit of two and a half million, so add another million. So basically, um, there's a increase in the deficit of about a million dollars a year. So then the next step we need to do, and this is where it might start getting a little complicated because it goes through town school formula and stuff. I'll get to that in a second, but just a couple of things that this points out. One is a million dollar structural deficit for the schools, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a second, but. So I think the phrase being used is, what is the nut we have to crack? Well, just for a so-called structural deficit, it's a million dollars on the school side. And you see over a three-year period, it's basically $3 million, so a million dollars a year. So, so, question, so this doesn't scale, but so if, if it's a $650,000 deficit, that's off a of base. Is that a two the fiscal plan information you showed before, is that a $257 million base? Uh, no, not, about? not that's a very seven. probably about... 225. So as a percentage of your fiscal plan, you've got a structural deficit of, what, half a percent? Three 
percent. Uh, yeah, less than a percent, yeah. The second thing it shows is that the town side does not have a deficit. And again, this does not include any costs associated with enrollment growth. That's important on this slide because the schools, the town absorbs 50% of that growth with the town school split. So if we assumed enrollment growth in here, the town would have a deficit as well. Um, in the out years, first year we should be all right. Uh, next two years would have a deficit. Um, so the next slide, my, I was guessing that there might be a question. Well, the prior slide showed a uh, surplus prior to collective bargaining of two million and change. How do you get to the school share? So let me just go back. So this says before bargaining, there's a surplus in fiscal 15 of 2.2 .2 million dollars, and then. I'm showing a town surplus of 1.3 and a school surplus of 900. So I'm assuming somebody's going to say, well, how do you know that of the 2.2, the schools is 900? So the way you get that is you take the additional net revenue the schools get to the town, town school partnership, which is the next slide, so I'll get to that. And then you subtract from it their growth need, again, exclusive of enrollment. So 2621888 which I'll get to in the next slide, minus 1.725, which is the sum of these three items, steps, special education, and inflation. Subtract the two, you get $900,000. Okay, so going back again, start with 2.2 .2 before collective bargaining, town shares 1.3, after bargaining, 340,000. Schools, 900, bargaining of 1.9 million dollar deficit, all right? So then the town school split, again, I know this is nearly impossible seeing the screen. Hopefully it's clearer on a piece of paper. Um, and I know one of the committees is going to be looking at this too. So total revenue growth is up here. It's basically split 50-50. The only part that isn't are these reimbursements to the general fund from town special revenue funds. And you see they net out down here anyway, so you can almost delete these. They're kind of meaningless up there. These are the fixed costs that are split 50-50, like growth in the refuse budget, growth in the uh, reserve fund. Um, well, actually, it's a reduction in um, fiscal 15 because we put some one-time money in there in case the feds cut some uh, school grants. 50-50 uh, split of the um, pay-as-you-go capital, 50-50 split of debt, regardless of where the debt's going to or what the pay-as-you-go capital's going to, which is primarily in the school side, it's split 50-50. And then special ed tuition and other special ed, which is uh, in district. Um, one of them split 50-50. I can't even read the other one slide. Uh, tuition is split 50-50. In-house is split 75-25. And then non-appropriate is split 50-50. Benefits are split based upon actual use. There's a whole other part of this slide that I spared you that show the percentage splits for health insurance, pensions, life insurance, all those things. What you see here is the town school split based on actual use. Utilities, this is a, admittedly a plug number right now. We're pretty confident there's going to be decreased because we've got a new natural gas contract in place. Um, so this number is going to change. Um, it could also change if the schools want to put more money into repair and maintenance. Um, it's in the town budget, but we net it out here. So what ends up happening is a net revenue increase. So the school's budget would grow by this number down here, which is at $2.6 million. So to put it in really simple math, the left side's the school, the right side's the town. The schools, and this is looking just at 15. The schools have direct expenditure growth of 3.3 million, steps, inflation, collective bargaining, special education, net of town share, the town share is right here. So if you add those two together, it's 750. Then the indirect, which it benefits, the 50-50 split of the CIP and debt service pays to go capital, 50-50 split of non-appropriated, and then some of those little odds and ends that were floating around. Um, <clears throat> total expenditure growth of 4.8. Town schools partnership agreement gives them 3.8. Deficit of $984,000. Town side steps of 250. So com comparatively speaking here, 750 versus uh, 250. Inflation pretty similar. Collective bargaining. Uh, different primarily because of the tail on the fiscal 14 contract. So $1.4 million of direct growth, indirect, our share of special education through the formula, 
benefits 1 6, 50 50 split of non appropriated CIP, miscellaneous. So our budget's grown 3 6 versus revenue of 4. We have a $339,000 surplus as of today, which would obviously not be a surplus that would go somewhere. Um, and again, if enrollment were factored in here right now with 750, this would be zero. This 50% of 750 is a number pretty close to that. So we'd have a balanced budget um, if we were talking about that. So <clears throat> mine was the easy part, I think, talking about the you know so-called structural deficit. And we've said it in round numbers before, but it shows about a million dollars a year delta between our revenue assumptions and the expenditure assumption. So if there's any questions. Thank you, Sean. Questions before we move on to the school side? Okay. Uh, I actually have a question. Sean, why does the school benefit growth is one million and the town side is one point six million? What's going on there? We absorb about seventy five percent of the growth in pensions. Okay. So that's that's because the school that is the pension pension the, yeah, is the biggest, that because yeah. the schools the schools make up about 55, give or take, percent of health insurance, um, uh, OPEBs, life insurance. We make up about 75 percent of pensions. Good. Okay. The other stuff's kind of small. The other stuff's based on actual, well, they're all based on use. Workers' comp is mostly us because, um, you know, we got guys out in the field and stuff. Um, unemployment actually has been mostly schools, but big number is pension. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the math teachers association takes care of the well the teachers take care of themselves through the math teachers association but what about <coughs> other staff in the schools custodians school that's nurses town. town that's their 25 percent that's their 20 okay thank you i'm sorry i got you thank you all right thank you Just take a minute here and get our slideshow up. <clears throat> so thank you. We'd like to actually begin um, where Sean left off, so that if you go back to that last slide uh, and look at in his simplified FY15 structural deficit, um, the, the summary that shows um, that we would have a, a $984,000 structural deficit based on the uh, movement of steps, collective bargaining, if, you, if we assume 2 percent, we haven't yet um, negotiated any contracts, but if you assume 2 percent, um, and um, our, our percentage of total salary is actually larger than the town, so our 2 percent is actually a higher uh, total cost. The, the tail on this one's about half a million. Um, and then the, the uh, direct cost of the benefits, as Sean pointed out, um, allocated back to our budget, it shows that we would have a $984,000 structural deficit. What we want to talk about is really what has caused this committee to be brought about which is a structural deficit that's been pushed by the growth of enrollment that over the last nine years has uh, moved um, thir over 1,300 students into our elementary schools, uh, increase in enrollment, the growth, 1,300 students, 35 percent growth at the elementary level. And so when we look at the pressure on our budget and the impact as we've tried to accommodate that over the last uh, nine years, what we've done is we've increased our direct services and for the most part not been able to uh, increase in other areas in our budget. So what we uh, bring you tonight is an explanation for why we feel that there's pressure on our budget that is as high as 4.6 million of pressure uh, that we'd like to see addressed in FY15 in order to put us back to a position uh, that would be comparable to where we feel we were back in uh, uh, nine years ago before we started. And with, with that, to frame this, uh, Bill wanted to talk some about our assumptions uh, behind that calculation of that $4.6 million. Yeah. Thanks. So um, my particular part here tonight is to take you through these assumptions before Peter shares with you the numbers that, that, that come out of 
uh, the elements that he talked about and these assumptions. So um, assumption one is really where we what we talked about when we began here a few weeks ago with you. Um, we've we've made these assumptions based on uh, policy choices that are presently in place by the school department, um, which are included on this slide, which you may remember from from the last time we were here, um, around class size and our early childhood programs and neighborhood schools and the array of programs, our paraprofessionals, our commitment to Medco materials fee, those kinds of things. Um, we've assumed all of those assumptions um, in, in this projection, um, as well as policy decisions like the class size guidelines that we currently utilize. And, um, and one that we didn't talk about the last time, which is a policy um, by which we, we look at the um, high school minimum classes that we run, the minimum class size on certain classes that we run. So any class that's under 15, um, the headmaster and I go through um, and try to determine the reasoning behind running that, that class and make a decision as to whether those classes will run or not. So we've made all those assumptions um, in, this, in, these, um, in this program. Um, the enrollment that we've assumed is, is, is exactly what we, we showed in our presentation a few weeks ago. That is FY15 through 19, a projection of an incoming 630 kindergartners per year. Beyond that, we've used 600 as the number. Um, we've also uh, projected here no consolidations or growth. Now, that's not actually the way it plays out, but as we look at it over the last five or six years, we've found that our consolidations of sections have essentially been equaled by other grade levels, a second grade here, a fourth grade there, where we had to add another section. So we've actually just assumed a balancing out of any consolidations with, with growth in sections other than kindergarten. Um, salary and benefits, um, we've used what, what we normally use in our budget process, an assumed um, starting salary um, for any new hire um, in FY15 terms of $58,000 and a benefit premium for health insurance and other benefits associated with our positions of, of 25%. Um, the assumption we use in our budget process is that any time we add a K-8 to section, we actually add 1.3 FTE. And we do that because it's not just a classroom teacher that we add there. It's, it's also the specials of music, art, health, and physical education. And over time, um, we've either set that at, at 0.2 or 0.3, depending on, on the year, um, uh, in terms of making sure that we have adequate staffing to address um, the sections um, that we create. In elementary world language, which is not a special, meaning the classroom teacher stays with the students, during those classes. Um, we've just related this FTE growth to, a, to an equation of the number of sections um, that we would grow. And Peter, that was about a point one? Point one per section. Three. Yeah, point one in K2. So it varies by the grade level because the amount of time that students have world language differs by grade level. First grade, K1, they have a shorter period of time, three times a week than students in second and third. So essentially, it balanced out at about a 0.15. Is that right? Overall, I think it's a 0.15 across the grade levels that we use for every new section. Um, at Brookline High School, where you'll see in the charts that Peter's going to show you, we project quite a bit of growth. Um, we've used the current uh, FY14 student to teacher ratio, which is 14.2 students to a teacher. Um, that projection includes all of our administrator FTEs who teach part time. Nearly every administrator in the building has a point to teaching responsibility as part of their job. So they've factored into that 14.2 to 1. Do they factor in as a full? Uh, they factor in as a point two. As a point two. Yes. Okay. Um, in regular education support, which is the second area where you'll see the real projected growth in these charts Peter's going to show you, primarily for the reason that he mentioned earlier, these are the areas that we have not kept up. We've kept up with classroom teachers as we've grown sections, but when we look at nurses, K-8 guidance counselors, um, even some in high school guidance counselors, what we've projected these out at are either the um, standards of their professional associations, which is what you see listed here, um, or in the case of high school guidance counselors, um, we actually used 195 because the national standard for high school guidance counselors is 250 to 1. The Metro West ratio is, is about 185 to 1. So we keep tabs on that in the Metro West district. We used for, just for estimation here, 195 
um, 195 students to one guidance counselor. In special ed and ELL, we've merely adjusted for the numbers of students. So we, we, we've projected that X number of new incoming students lead to the same kinds of percentages that we've seen. Some people have suggested to us that with respect to ELL, that's actually low because our ELL percentages have act actually outstripped our overall student growth, meaning they've been larger. So, so there is an argument to be made that we actually should have adjusted that uh, upward a little, a little higher than we did. But we've used the percentage increase that we see overall. Yeah. Perhaps I missed it, but can we, um, is the, for example, when you say nursing 500 students to one nurse, yes. psychologist, and so on, is that what we currently have? No. Or is that the standard? That's the standard. Do we know, do we have the standard? We're going to show you that. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And, and when you do, can you also refresh our memory? I know you have some contracts with things like Brookline Community Mental Health that preferred certain services. Yes. Thank you. Um, in special education support, uh, not all the ca categor these categories have increased um, in a way that's proportional to the growing demand. Uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech and language, team facilitators, and our board certified behavior analysts. Um, and the proposal reflects bringing those staff to recommended standards in FY15. Um, in terms of administration, I'll do the building based first. So we've made adjustments uh, here to reflect administration at building levels for the size of the buildings that, that we're projecting here. For example, um, you will see that with respect um, to, uh, well, you won't see these in, in individually broken out. But for example, in a devotion school that is, a, is projected to be 1,000 students, we've projected that out as a principal and three assistants. It's right now a principal and two. Um, a building that's going to be 800, we've projected out as a principal and two assistants. They're, all of our other schools are presently a principal and one. Um, the, we've made uh, similar adjustments to the Brookline High School administration, accounting for a student uh, population that will grow from 1,800 to at least 2,500. And we've made similar projections for running the old Lincoln School for something over some period of time in the very near future as overflow space of some grade levels from some schools yet to be determined. So we've accounted for an administration of that school. Um, in the central office, you'll see two, ast um, two asterisks next to two positions. Those are positions that we have lost over the last number of years. Um, and we've projected a number of positions that we believe that we need in central office in order to serve um, a student population that is um, well, it's projected to be closer to 8,000 and was 5,400 with the central office that you have here serving now 7,300 students. Um, we've made some projections for program enhancements, uh, an increase to steps to success. Our program, which right now currently serves students in fourth grade through 12th grade in public housing, we don't know what those enhancements are yet. There's talk within steps of expanding into the lower grades. There's talk of expanding outside of public housing. Um, so we've made some, um, some and, and we're going to have a growing student population. We know that. Um, we've made um, some um, uh, projections here of, of, uh, of amounts to uh, fund our ECS model, our, our Enrichment and Challenge Support model, whatever that may be, whatever comes out of the program review process that we're currently involved in. Um, we won't do education technology tonight. We're going to ask you if we can come back another night to actually do that presentation, which we're doing for the school committee tomorrow night. Um, but there's staffing here around that ed, that ed tech plan. Um, our literacy initiative, our, our math specialists. You remember when we talked last time, we talked about our uh, model for paraprofessionals, which was originally projected to be K through 2. Um, we've only been able to put into place a K through 1, and we showed you some of the corresponding savings as a result of that model. We're projecting here to look at being able to put the second grade model into place. Um, increases to our materials and supply budgets and increases to our professional learning budgets. Um, yeah? Does the uh, making of teaching second grade paraprofessionals, does that meet the savings? It does. Program? We believe it at least pays for itself. Um, in building, yeah, I'm sorry. MCAS? No, we've par targeted second grade because the original model that we set out to put in place was a K through 2 model. The research that we had done, some districts even in, in the Commonwealth, um, found that, that we were able to they were able to offset the number of one-to-one -one paraprofessionals 
assigned to students later on in grade by providing that support across the grade level in every classroom in K through two. And that's indeed what we've seen in the K through one model. So it was really a primary preventative model. Um, building support is really around the additional space that will be created as a result of the projected building projects and the custodial security building services and energy costs in those of, of adding 100,000 to 200,000 square feet. And the last one, more than an assumption, is just sort of a caveat to remember here that, um, that there's a lot that we don't know. We don't know, for example, in, in a devotion school that is now projected to be 1,000 students, we don't know what the model is that we'll arrive at. We don't know if it'll be a principal and three assistants. It could be a principal of an upper school. It could be some kind of configuration that demands something different than what we do now. And so we haven't captured all those costs here. It, doesn't, it does not include assumptions. It includes assumptions for just continuing what we're doing at Brookline High School. It doesn't include projections for what a second high school would look like if that's where the model ends up. And it doesn't include projections because we quite frankly don't know how to do them this moment for what we call the destabilizing effect of merging staff at Old Lincoln School. So we're going to do something for some short time at Old Lincoln School. And it probably is going to involve pulling a certain number of grades out of a certain number of schools. And what that does, because our staff, particularly our specialist staff, are so marbled across the grade levels, is it it's going to require some additional FTEs for the things like I showed you earlier, like music, art, phys ed, because right now those people do K through 8. And they can't do K through 8 if they're not in the same building. So there is some destabilizing effect that's going to occur that's going to demand some short-term term staffing that we'll have to account for. So those are the assumptions that we built, what Peter's now going to go through with you in terms of numbers. Mr. Rowe. So let me begin by just quickly showing um, what we believe the section count, how that will change over um, a, 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 the next eight years. What we show here, what we show is the base year plus eight years. The reason we go out to fiscal 22 is when you look at our numbers, our student enrollments, that's when we approximately reach the $2,500 uh, $2, sure. <laughs> 2, student number at the high school. Um, and when we reach essentially stasis at the elementary schools with approximately 600 students per class. So it is um, if we um, are able to maintain the low enrollment that we've projected in here, which is 630 kindergarten for the next five years and then 600 for the three years after that. And the reason I say that's low is because that's really what we've averaged over the last four years. Uh, and our fear is that that number could grow on us. And we see no data that would indicate that those numbers are going to drop below that. Uh, and, and certainly we see no data, as I think you may recall from the presentation that I made about a month ago, that shows that the cohort survival um, process within Brookline is that your first grade class is a very strong predictor of the enrollment of that very same group of students in the high school. It hits 100 percent at 10th grade and it never ranges less than 96 percent. So there's, there's no data that I've been able to find that would indicate that those numbers are going to go below that. So that if we... Um, and you haven't yeah. factored in the impact of Hancock Village then? We have no. not. This, this is pre-Hancock Village assumptions. Um, so that uh, what we did do here is we look at the base at the K-8, uh, we currently have 248 sections uh, K-8 to in our elementary schools. And we have 126 and a half uh, teaching full-time equivalents at the high school. Uh, and so what we do is we project those forward each year uh, based on a formula of student growth. And uh, it's, the, it's really the last page of the document. Let me just take you there so that... But why are you adding teachers as sections? Why are we adding teachers for sections? No, you, there, you, you have K-8 sections and high school yep. teachers. Those yeah, because uh, the behavior of how we staff at the elementary level is different from how we staff at the high school level. In other words, you can look at, a, um, for the most part, at least K through 5 and occasionally K through 6, <clears throat> we'll have a self-contained homeroom. And then the teacher needs to be 
uh, relieved for uh, a period of day when they go to specials or when the, the teacher is at lunch or some other activity. So that the formula of 1.3 allows us to fund the full-time teacher plus the specialist that relieves that teacher during the day. At the high school, the schedule is different. The high school generally resembles a seven-period day. I mean, it, it actually varies uh, in the course of the week. Um, and teachers teach uh, a load of uh, four um, major classes plus another activity where they're involved with students. And so that the formula is, is uh, different at the high school. That's not making my question. Okay. Lee, were you talking to the microphone just because of the TV? Um, in K to 8, a section roughly corresponds to a classroom, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. In the high school, does a teacher correspond to a classroom, or do you have, does it, is it more than one teacher, one point something teachers per classroom? Uh, one, yes, higher than 1.3. It's probably closer to 1.6, yeah. Okay. So the, the, that's, what I, that's why I was asking why we're adding these two numbers, because it seems to me if we're looking at facilities, we want to reduce the number of high school teachers to the equivalent number of classrooms and then add that to the elementary school classrooms, no? Uh, well, here's what we did here that's actually different from that. The formula was that at the um, K-8 level, we looked at the enrollment. If I can get my pointer here. We looked at the enrollment, as you see, 630 for five years and then 600. And then we looked at um, the, the, um, how that enrollment would, would uh, change. And then we also looked at how those sections would change. So this is the change in section at the K-8 levels. So that, for instance, you see from, from this year, FY14 with 247, projecting to next year, um, the multiple of 1.3 would require 9.1 additional teachers to staff the additional sections. It's not a 9.1 section growth, but it's a 9.1 teacher growth. The same formula is used at the high school. The 126.5 teachers will need to grow by 5.2 to formulaically provide the additional service next year uh, to fund the additional 74 students that we expect to grow at the high school. So it's, it's really driven by enrollment growth, but factored into sectioning as we expect it to happen. So that's the base of which the calculation was done. So to go back to the beginning, uh, when we carry this forward, so when you look at regular education teachers, the same 9.1 at the K-8 level and the 5.2 at the high school level would indicate we'd need growth of 14.3 staff to serve the two to serve the equivalent formula of the 247 sections that actually has more teachers because we have specialists on top of that. But in this growth, we're funding both the classroom teacher and the specialist. Now we so use that. Peter, I'm seeing some furrowed brows around the table. Can you? I, I might rewind you about. Two and a half minutes. I, do people need that again, or are you guys? Is everyone tracking? Well, could you just clarify when you add sections plus teachers, your total, that total column is sixty-eight what? Sixty-eight teachers. Teachers. Okay. That I think was the confusion that we were having apples and oranges added. I'm still but they were really this is confused because sure. if you have, I, I thought that you had in the K through eight, you had 1.3 teachers per section. So wouldn't that number be something higher than 20 if, you, if the total is teachers? Okay, let me, let me just rewind for a second. Okay, let's look at the base. This year, 147 sections. So okay. we're on page 12. Everyone Excuse run, me, yeah, I can't we're read. on page 12. 247 sections, okay? Let me go to the next page. If you take those 247 sections and and need to look at the growth of sections for FY15 and take the number of sections, which is what I've done, and multiply by 1.3, you need 9.1 additional teachers. Peter, if, I think, if I think you go back to the, sorry, if you go back to the prior slide, going from fiscal, just, I, I think what, what you're trying to say is you go from 247 to 254 in sections, that's an addition of seven sections, and then you go to the next yep. slide. Seven sections times 1.3 per section gives teachers. you 9.1 yes. additional teachers. That's correct. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think yeah. the, the confusion is coming because I think you're answering a different question than the one that, was, that, uh, that Lee was asking, and that's where I think some of the, some of the confusion is coming. Sure. Um, the confusion really is not how it relates to the other slides where I think it makes sense. 
but here where you've got one column which is classrooms, which gets multiplied by 1.3, another column which is teachers, and then you have a total column mm -hmm. which is adding them. No, I, yeah. if, if you can stick with just that one, because I think going over is not where the confusion is. Um, it, it doesn't seem like the total column is actually a meaningful calculation. Yeah. So maybe so maybe I, I, that I could just be to, left off I mean, and we I could guess, just... Fine. Let's move on to this. I, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to understand is it seems to me if I wanted to know the number of classrooms, I should be adding elementary school sections and high school classrooms. If I wanted to know the number of teachers, then I should be adding elementary school classrooms times the teacher factor plus the high school teacher. Right. But I, right I, now I, I'm adding two things that are... I, don't, don't. And, and, and I think I think basically those those and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think those uh, columns on the prior slide are really just inputs okay. that so, happen so to have a total yeah. column next to them that we should ignore. Should, the total column shouldn't be there. And then these exactly. then this is this is the calculation that actually matters off of those. Okay. Yeah, this is the growth each year from that formula, and it's the growth that matters for this calculation. Right. Um, so that what you see is for each excuse me for each year. This is the FTE that we expect for our regular education growth. And this is the cost based on the projection that we've done. Similarly, if we look at um, the Sorry. current, yes. I think yeah. the excess, I started looking at dollar figures yeah. um, in the previous one. Yeah. So what, how are you calculating the salary? They're based on 58,000 a year. Which is our which is the average salary at which we hired in the current year. We hired, right. Right. Okay. Um, and we're um, adding 25% uh, benefit premium on top of that. Okay. Our assumption is that steps and collective bargaining, which would be the growth cost annually, are carried in the formula that Sean showed you, which is the base. And so that to try and do a comparative over time, we just looked and held a dollar constant. We're, we're not taking into account any of the inherent future growth and costs that comes from an expansion this year. That's correct. That's correct. This is, this is saying if the cost of, a, of hiring one professional was the same each year, this is what that number would be. I think I was saying something different. <laughs> we're saying this is what it's costing this year. We know because of steps and lanes it's going to cost us extra next year. Mm -hmm. And that's not factored into this calculation of the new costs. Because it's, fa because it's factored into the town school formula prior to this cost. Right. As, not, not to new people. Okay. Not to new people. No. Well, as, as there has been growth in the past, my understanding is that the steps and lanes has netted out to an increase of about seven about 750 yeah. per we year. We actually did a little right. better this year. That's and, that's, right. yeah. and that's in Sean's numbers. Right. I, I so understand that. In turn, but in terms of thinking about what is the cost of the growth, right? a lot of the current steps and lanes, right? steps and lanes on average, if you weren't growing as a, as a school system, should be zero. You know, the, that it would fluctuate around zero. Sometimes it would be positive. Sometimes it would be negative. But the people leaving would offset the growth in steps for the people who... Yeah, arguably, yeah. Right? right? It, has to, it has to be zero in the long run. But because we've been growing, the very large steps and lanes that we are currently paying reflects the recent enrollment growth, right? And when we're trying to figure out how much enrollment growth is costing the school system, we're only saying, what does it cost, the enrollment cost, growth cost the first year, we're not asking how much does the enrollment growth this year cost next year and the year after. I'm just clarifying. Well, shouldn't it be the other way around? If, if, we, if we have growth, we should be presumably hiring more, more younger teachers, right? And, right, and they're, getting, and they're on the bottom of the steps and lanes. Right? If we were declining, yeah. we would not be hiring anybody. The people would be at the top of the right. scales, and, we, and we'd be doing great. Like the question is, are these new hires, like are, are the steps and lanes in, in Sean's numbers the people who are already on staff, yes. or yeah. do they also include these new hires? Is, is the question, is that yeah. right? Well, that's another way of putting it, yeah. But I, I, and I think that you have really in, used the actual experience for steps and lanes 
and I'm not Correct. questioning anybody's no, numbers. No. I'm, I'm asking, I'm trying to make sure where, what, 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 what's being captured where, right? And what's being captured here is the first year cost of enrollment grid, right? Mm -hmm. right? For, each sub, for each individual, for each grid. Right, right. Yeah, I think um, if, you, if you look at this, uh, my presumption in this was we're capturing, as you say, the first year cost to the extent that adding in the first year, FY15, 14, one of the 20s not working, the 14.3 additional FTEs over the base, to the extent that there in the second year their steps would rise, that is not captured. Um, is but it I think also it's, not I think in the, in Sean's numbers? No, it is. I think, I think in the big yeah. picture it's de minimis. Okay. Right. On a, on a base of the 500 teachers we have, the question of whether we captured in an eight-year projection the steps, I think, is not the point of the presentation. I think the point of the presentation is that we face over a million-dollar cost for next year for our enrollment growth that we are projecting right now. And as we look ahead to the following year, where we would expect another nine and a half to 10 positions, we face another $700,000. I don't know whether that will be exactly 682. It won't be. It might be 700. It might be 650. It'll depend on the mix and the turnover of staff because, for instance, we budgeted 750,000 this year for steps and lanes. And when our hiring was done, I think we spent about 550. And you can see that information in our first quarter report that we released last week. So there are, vari there are variables in each of these. And as you can imagine, as we begin to look forward um, to years farther out, we, you know, we lose some of, the, some of the accuracy. You're using the same 58,000 for both elementary and high school. Is, is, is in fact that accurate? or Probably not. It, in fact, if you look at the mix, um, to the extent that we fill more specialized positions, they're probably higher on average. In the high school? Uh, in any, for instance, a special ed teacher at an elementary level may turn out to be higher than an English teacher at the high school. So it really is going to vary by department and specialty. I think your question is 58. Answer your question for My this question is year. on average, yeah. is the 58 right. lower? Is 58, is that, is that a good number for the whole system? Or yes, is it, it is. It's accurate and exact for this year. Right. Now, we haven't actually analyzed it by school. That, well, and in I, any okay. given year, it'll be different. That's still not my question. My oh, question sorry. is, if, if, <laughs> is if, if I confine it just to the high school on the one hand and just to the K-8 schools on the other, is, are they each 58 or are the, is there a differentiation? We didn't break it out this year yet. I can break it out for you because we have the data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let me, uh, it, it, the answer is, um, Lee, that it depends. Um, it's, it's really dependent on, on, the, on the year and what positions are available. It's really much more than being driven by the school, the level of the school. It's which positions happen to be open, right? So if we have a year when we're looking at m more specialized positions, um, positions in certain languages, positions in physics, positions in special education at the high school, we know that that year the high school numbers are going to be higher, right? If we have that kind of profile at the elementary level, we know they're going to be higher. It's much more driven by the particular um, uh, availability of staff in particular areas Those than are by about the school. New positions. I'm, I'm just asking about an, uh, the overall average. Um, it, yeah, I don't think I don't think we'd be able to to predict okay. um, based on that. Any other questions? No. It, so our, our overall average new hire this year was fifty-eight thousand. Can I just do a, a quick follow-up on that? Yeah. Um, given that if we're looking at these as being um, driven by enrollment growth, is it, it, it seems like it, you know, it's not going to be necessarily the, the, the highly specialized positions like, oh, this year we have to replace the physics teacher. Sure. Um, so is it, is it reasonable to assume that that 58,000 is probably more accurate than, than, than usual yes. for, well, it, for, it, this, for this yeah. particular right. yes. for this if you analysis? Look at, if you look at the first quarter report, that we just issued last week on this year's hiring. It shows that we hired net 68, I believe it was, full-time equivalent teachers, nurses, BCBAs, in other words, specialists in what we call our unit A group, professionals in that certified uh, licensed group. They averaged 58,000. So it was a mix of different folks. 
Some of those were newly budgeted positions. Some of them were a replacement for retirements, resignations. So this is presumed on the same mix of movement over time, of which a group will be new positions. The, um, to move to the next group, um, we looked at our special education and ELL teachers and applied the same formulas. Uh, actually, we applied a different formula, which was uh, based on the ratio of students. Uh, and, and what it um, defines is growth. If you, for instance, look at special education, <clears throat> the ratios of enrollment growth to the current staffing uh, would increase 1.7 uh, in FY15 for special education teachers a half a position for ELL at the K-8 level, 1.2 special ed positions at the high school, and uh, a 0.1, a small ad for English language learners at the, the high school. The, the pressure would be approximately 3.5 positions uh, for our specialist teachers, specialist meaning special education and English language learners. So that formula uh, is applied annually, and uh, again, we, it drove the number that for FY15 for this group would be $252,000. Um, the, the next group, and, and this is the question Carol asked earlier, was if we looked at applying um, a standard from the Professional Association for Nurses, Psychologists, Guidance K-8, and then the, the local Metro West standard for uh, guidance for the high school, the numbers that we carry here for FY14 are our current staffing. So for instance, for elementary world language, we have 14.6 staff. Uh, we have 11 nurses system-wide, nine psychologists, 12 guidance at the K-8 level, and eight at the high school. Uh, so that the increase to get us to standard for next year would be 14.2 positions. And so, and then the enrollment formula, uh, excuse me, the enrollment formula would then increase annually somewhere in the range for the first four years of one and a half or so positions because that's when our lo largest enrollment growth is, and then it begins to, to slow down. So that to bring us to standard in year one in this group uh, is just over a million dollars. Um, can, can I ask a question? Quick, quick, so th this is, so far, this is the only area where there's a, a catch up, so to speak, right? Where you're sort of, the, the rest has really all been enrollment based on a really small class leaving the high school with a bigger class coming in and a really small class leaving the eighth grade and a bigger kindergarten class coming in. Is yes, because what we believe we've done over the last nine years as we've had enrollment growth at the elementary level is we've primarily funded the classroom teacher and the specialist teachers, music, art, uh, phys education, uh, and some of the specialists at the seventh and eighth grade to allow those those classroom teachers to to have their, their release so that we've we've funded the core additionally we funded the direct classroom service for special education and English language learner um, um, staff what we have not for the most part been able to do is fund um, any growth in nursing um, guidance K-8 and guidance at the high school. I, there, I think there has been some adjustment in psychologists um, that we have moved. Peter, um, Peter, hang on, Carol. Elementary world language up as Peter, well. Um, yeah, Sean, yeah. To what extent, so we're talking about nursing, psychologists, and guidance counselors. Okay. That's what we're talking about. And right now we are below standard. And standard is defined as the, the standard that's, that's defined by the professional association. How was that standard arrived at, and, and how off are we compared to our other communities in our neighborhood? Um, I don't actually have the data, um, Karen May, on uh, nursing guidance and psychologist K-8. The, that is what we're yeah. talking about, is that correct? That's correct, okay. yeah. Um, what, I, what I've been told, or what I actually saw was the ratios that uh, the Metro West communities um, sent into a survey. Uh, and that's what Bill was referring to earlier. Um, the, uh, and so we took a mix of those communities. They range from about 185 to 210. And so we actually took the, the, uh, the average of those and said we should target somewhere at uh, uh, mid-190. Uh, so that's why we chose <coughs> 195. Okay, Jim. Where were we before? What is the benchmark we want to be at? How many, mm -hmm. how many did we reach? 
Um, would it be reasonable to look at some other models, like say the private school model, to determine the existing teachers? You usually have one guidance counselor for uh, a larger set of students, and then you'll have a number of uh, teachers who are well known for students who are, if you will, adjuncts who work for that guidance counselor, or who are really bulking up, especially in the area of guidance. We've got about 4.7 positions for one year past history, and 15 total, 8.8 to 8.5 over the period of time you're looking at. Is that something that's reasonable to look at? Or? Well, I, I think it is. I mean, um, what you really notice is that with the 12 guidance staff at the K-8, I believe that number was the same uh, nine years ago. Do you remember a period with a bit growth over the last nine years? It was, it, it was at least 11. So the answer is we haven't moved that staffing up as the enrollment's grown. Um, we, um, as I say, we have done some adjustment in psychological uh, uh, staffing. Their service tends to be service to students um, in, in um, assessments that may lead to, to education plans so that there's a demand in student services for that. Yeah. Let me just question. So um, I think it depends on the private school. My son went to one where, where they were very rich in terms of their, their high school guidance staffing. But, um, but we actually do some of that now. Um, at the high school, there are people associated with teachers associated with particular programs who act as the guidance counselor to that group of, of students. School within a school is one, one example, and there, are, and there are others within the high school. And I don't, I don't think that, that will change. So, so there is some of that, and it tends to be that one category where there's an opportunity to do that much more than the others. Okay, Lisa. I, I don't know if you will, but I'm going to Can you find a microphone? On the elementary world language, you noted that it's not considered as special because That's the right. teachers stay in the room with. That's right. So we're sort of double teaming. And uh, wh why? What drives that? Yeah. So that was the model that we put together. That was put together by the task force that was formed that led to the override question in 08. Mm -hmm. And and the, there are lots of reasons. The main was that so the language could be integrated into the classroom. There was a, there was a thought that doing that. At the primary level, three times 20 a week, whether it's at the intermediate level where I think it's three times 30 a week, that there, there was an opportunity for integration in the classroom if the classroom teacher was part of that instruction. Um, I wanted to ask whether this is the, the moment where the question I'd asked earlier about the Brookline Community Mental Health Services, are they providing any of the services that are identified here? Um, no, not what's identified here. Okay. There are services provided. Do you want to say something to this? Yeah, I'm going to ask Dr. Schmuckler to address that if that's okay. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm offering this really to, so we can better understand that there are that's some great. things that are contracted out and there are other things which are handled internally. I just wanted to understand mm -hmm. a little more. So. Um, a number of years ago when the social work positions were cut in the elementary school, so right now K through eight, there's only one social worker in all K through eight schools and that's at the devotion school where we have our program for students with social emotional disabilities. So Brookline Mental Health Center is providing a lot of the clinical services um, on a contract basis within our schools um, because there has been, they filled the vacuum when the social workers positions were eliminated. Um, so within these, nu these numbers are not the contracted services. Thank you. Does it help? Anything else before we move on? Oh, Lee. Yeah. The, the, the number of SPED teachers, K-8 SPED teachers, seems to be almost exactly 25% of the number of sections. Um, and that seems to flow, th th flow through. So I guess my first question in that is, is that by formula or is that you made a separate projection, or am I reading it wrong? Um, no, the 62.4 the, um, is the number of special education teachers at the elementary level this year, and 29 is the number at the high school. No, but I'm saying if I, if yeah. I yeah, if go you do year over year, it seems to have the same relationship. When you said before that in the K-8 there was 1.3 teachers per classroom, were you including the 0.25 special ed teachers? No, in, no. In no, that's exclusive. That's Those are... Um, the point three accommodates the music, art, okay. uh, phys ed. How many additional trans uh, classrooms do the spe uh, special ed, the 60, 
some odd special ed teachers translate into. Literally classrooms. You're talking now physical building space? Physical build building yeah. space, in addition I, to the 247 section classrooms. I would, I would have to go back and check, but um, a significant number of classrooms in our schools are occupied by learning centers, um, by, um, by a host of different models of special education services, yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, it, it's a, a rough calculation would be this. Um, a learning center classroom associated with um, the primary, intermediate, and, and middle grade classrooms. So three classrooms for a learning center. And then it really comes down to... Per building. Per building, yes. Then it really comes down to um, what other kinds of specialized programs or district-wide programs might be located at a building. So you can figure some number, two to three classrooms would be my best guess at each building associated with those specialized programs, many of which are for the students who are in that neighborhood school, but some of which are district-wide programs as well. The district-wide programs we talked about a few weeks ago that we're building in order to bring kids back from, from out of district placement. Since you're only projecting in total a growth of about four special ed teachers, K-8, is it reasonable to assume that, that there will not be any material, any consequential change in the number of classrooms required? I think, um, I think we've accounted for most of that, um, if not all of it, in, in the work that the B-Space group did and that the school committee's done in looking at classrooms. Okay. Tim. Quick question. John, um, at, at the high school, you talked about uh, staffing ratios, not class sizes, although you did earlier reference class sizes of less than 15 as being something that are sort of individually looked at. Is that worth looking at? Because just in, in, in the numbers, it looked like there were 70-something new students projected, and that translated to five new teachers. And I'm kind of wondering how that then works with class size. So um, the class sizes that we end up looking at are, are, are really classes mainly around electives. And, and they tend to be in so, – so, for example, we tend to revisit on an annual basis dance classes. Right? We have a dance studio. It can hold X number of students. Are we going to run this class for 10 or 12 or 15? Right, and, and those tend to be the, the, the decision points, but they tend to almost all be electives. So um, that's a process we go through annually. Most of the time we run those classes. Um, there have been some, there's been some great work done by the headmaster over the last year to cut down on some of those, those classes and reschedule kids into other sections where we could to, to eliminate some of those sections. I do think it would be interesting to, at some point to get a sense for class size at the high school because <clears throat> you're looking at ratios, and so I don't know how that translates into that. the class sizes, particularly if you're sort of we, building up to staff. We balance. can absolutely do that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, and there clearly are going to be ranges where we have some, some probably over 25s, and then we have some lower ones. The number that, that we actually used for the high school was 14.25 pupil-teacher ratio. So if you look at the uh, this year's enrollment and the regular ed teachers, there's 14.25 students to each teacher. So that's what this ratio is that built in the regular education group back at uh, this group right here. And I guess the question I'm asking is, at some level, is there capacity where if you're t do you need five new teachers to, to, to absorb, I think, I think the, when I did the math, it was 74 new students, because I think that's the way the math Right, works. and that's why that's where the 14.25 yield But I guess that comes, yeah. that's not just a, a, a student-teacher ratio, that's also a class size capacity issue, I would think. That's correct, that's correct. And we, we received information from the high school staff this year that there was significant um, discomfort in, in assigning students to a number of classes and, and that there was pressure because those teachers obviously get distributed across a number of subjects and then within subjects a number of specialties within those and so then as students select some students get denied some we student wants to get uh, be the last kid in that section when they push the lid to 26 or to 27 those kinds of issues rather than create a second class so so that's the pressure, and certainly the information that we received this year is there's not a lot of flexibility at the high school. And so that's why the ratio that we used is the current um, ratio that, that we have. And we, we did the same thing at the elementary level. Peter, there's a couple yeah. more. Sorry. Yeah, Carol. Sorry, yeah. Um, this is, a, I guess, a naive question, but I am I'm surprised at this 14 to 1 uh, relationship that you described, because in my mind, I would think a teacher is teaching five periods, 15 to 20 kids in a class. So, so the no, 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 no. That's what not class size. Wrong. That's pupil-teacher ratio. 
That's not a, that's not the average class size. That's I understand a, that's that. the pupil teacher ratio. I understand. So I'm saying I'm still surprised. I would think that any individual teacher would be seeing more like 70 to 80 students in the course of a day. So why isn't the ratio much higher? I, I think the, a teacher might be seeing that many students, but each student is also going to be seeing multiple teachers. Yeah. So, so that's the explanation. Okay. Thank you. Just uh, this is probably on the margin, but was it this fall or two falls ago? Uh, students in the high school were no longer allowed to take two sciences. No, wasn't that that's in the past? I'll no. let Phil speak to that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so never mind that. I was wondering if we were going to reinstate science. It's a, it actually didn't happen. Okay, good. Um, and good and, to it, know. and <laughs> actually, it was never going to happen. Um, it was a matter of trying to make sure all students could uh, all students who wanted a science in the senior year, I believe it was, right, got got their science first before we went back and started scheduling kids for a second science. That's what happened. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Super last. So sorry to, oh. one, one other small follow-up, if I may, related to the Brookline Community Mental Health Center services. Um, and that has to do with the notion that, as I understand it at least, you're getting a significant number of social workers, perhaps eight. Is that accurate? No? One. Two? One? I guess what I'm trying to get a, a bit of a feeling for is this is a circumstance that developed because your own budgets did not allow you to provide your own social workers as school employees. So it became a, an outsourced service. I would, I guess, trying to understand is it only social workers or also psychologists is one question. And the other is could you offer any thoughts about whether this is an effective model, the, the outsourcing of some of these services, for example, on the delivery quality of service as well as on a cost basis. Thank you. I can try. Um, so um, it, they're neither necessary. So there are no psychologists who work providing psychological services from Brookline Mental Health Center, but they are clinicians. So some of them would be LICSWs. They'd be social workers. They're licensed mental health counselors, licensed marriage and family therapists. So their degree is a range of disciplines, but their role is they're all providing clinical counseling within the schools. Um, so it's, it meets a certain need, and it is cost effective. What it doesn't meet a need of students who might need counseling services on their IEPs because Brooklyn, they're a contracted third party and they are billing third party. Um, so they're, they're utilizing third party uh, reimbursement, uh, insurance reimbursement, which constrains some of what they can do as well. Um, so it meets a certain need with our students, many students um, uh, possibly in regular education who need additional counseling support. Uh, we've also seen, uh, which I think all school districts, an incredible increase in the level of um, pretty clinically complex issues that we didn't see in our schools a number of years ago. So they're certainly helping support um, sort of some more of the intense clinical needs, certainly in the upper grades. Thank you. Could I, could I just follow, follow up on that? I mean, my, my assumption is that the uh, professional association guidelines um, that are cited here do not assume um, a third-party con contractual relationship that provides some of the services such as we have. So interestingly enough, the, the ratios that are provided there are actually ratios that um, are general education ratios. And a lot of what our psychologists do are working with students with special education needs, um, which is regulatory. So in, in, in fact, I think we're even, we've used um, a broad ratio in terms of it's, it's one psychologist to 500 students in the mainstream. We currently have a situation be, where our psychologists are mainly servicing students in special education, with very few of them able to actually service students in regular education. Do the, do the professional associations deal with that issue? Um, they do, and it's actually a much lower ratio for psychologists to students in special education than one to 500. Okay. It would be more like one to 50 or one to 65. Okay. Can I just address, Sergio, the, on, on the bigger question? I, I think it's just a great question. And, and the truth of the matter is that when we look at contracted services in, in any area, when we look at going outside, we, we go through that set of judgments that you described around this decision and that we described a few weeks ago around bringing our home-based services back in. 
we go through that all the time in, in looking for efficiencies and looking for ways to better serve families. So in the case that you're talking about, we made that decision for a couple of reasons. The school district was down to a small enough number of social workers that our principals were reporting to us that they, they weren't seeing the impact that they needed. So we took those monies along with some era money that we had at the time, and that's how we created the team facilitator model, which allowed us to have our IEPs um, centered around eight people in elementary schools instead of the 26 people who were writing IEPs before. We thought that was a more cost-effective use of the dollars and a better use of the dollars to, to actually contract out for those services. And you know, with respect to home-based services, we went the other way this year. We were looking at what was happening. We were talking to parents. We were looking at our bottom line and seeing that parents and families weren't getting the level of service that we wanted, and we felt we were spending too much. And we brought it back in, and we believe we've saved money and provided better service. So we're doing those examinations all the time. Thank you. One, one final question. Uh, just is at the high school, just following up on the class size issue and, and capital utilization, is there information that shows the utilization of classrooms in the high school and the class sizes um, under, you know, the last year or two? Um, we should be able to, to run that from our scheduled um, okay. program. Yeah, something that would, that would tie the two together. Part of the exam that HMSH did around classroom right. utilization. That yeah, was I part mean, of what they looked at because the question was for HMFH, one of the questions was how, how long <coughs> could we continue to sustain a growing student population in the high school by using rooms differently, by creating additional spaces, and they made some projections on that which, made, which required them to go and look at the classroom utilization. So we have that even within the work they did. I mean, one confusion in that new study that I couldn't quite understand is they referred, for example, to some classrooms that were being used by the SWS program, which is very understandable, but those are children that are counted in the numbers already. So I, I couldn't figure out why those classrooms were sort of discarded or discounted in their tally. Does that make any sense, or am I misreading the report? So, Sergio, it's a great question, but I feel like we're veering a little bit um, into the capital discussion, which is really important. But I just, I, is, if there's an operating aspect to it, it would be great to hear, because I think there are other operating questions, and I know we're only on slide 15, and we have uh, 31 minutes. So, And just to say, we will have HMFH coming in to actually talk to the capital you. subcommittee, so they can address these. Is areas. that okay, Sergio? Yeah. Okay. Alberto. Um, from my perspective, uh, these are done in a top-down approach. Mm -hmm. um, if you do it on a bottoms-up approach, you would also consider that there are eight separate elementary schools. Mm -hmm. How does that change the picture, or is that for later? Um, <laughs> that really speaks to how we do our budget normally. We will normally begin the process. For, so for F, this is an example of how I would begin to model FY15. We will then meet with each principal and talk about what did they see happening within their school because at the at the local level they'll see changes that I may not see when I'm looking at the macro level and so the process any in any given year is to take a, a first cut from 30,000 feet and then sit with the principal and say does this make sense you know where is the pressure that we're not seeing it could come because they have a, a person who who teaches part-time and does something in, and we're looking to add in a particular area and it doesn't work for them. Or they may say, well, we have information that we're going to lose a few students in this area, so we think we're going to lose a section, but we also think we're going to need to break a section. So that we're, what we're saying here is we assume no growth and no consolidation. Th that generally doesn't happen. Uh, what we experienced this year was the, the change was a net negative one. Uh, you know, so that there'll be change. Well, that that yeah. process hasn't occurred. That hasn't occurred for FY15, but it's part of the normal process that we'd go through, yes. Jim. Um, just a, a, a clarification. I think it was a couple of slides, two slide 19, there was a different staff meeting from the World sure. of Growth in that section. And support staff and the slide 17, executive staff meeting from the World of Growth and regular education staff. And I guess one thing I'm, I'm trying to understand is if you take a look, for example, slide 17, FY15, Mm -hmm. And then there are relatively modest jumps. And the same thing is true on slide 19. There's a very large jump in FY14, and then right. the other one is not. Is there, a, is there a first year sort of a big catching up on some? And I guess yes, I'm, I'm not understanding it. exactly how those numbers. We're assuming that's it. we get a recovery from the ratios. Hang on a second. But this is no, well, uh, actually, yeah. 
Why is there a well, one-year no, jump? No, what's going on here, um, the, the, uh, it's mislabeled. You notice how FY22 is missing numbers? Shift each of those down. The 12 is the growth in FY15 from the base. But, Jim, the, the answer to your question is yes. Yeah, the slide There's is a one year wrong. No, no, Notice no. the FY, look, look at OTPT speech VCBA. Understood. Current staffing is 34.3. We're projecting to get to the formula that Karen suggested we needed to be at in this group. We applied a formula that would increase to 46.3. That's the 12. The 12 should be in the FY15 box. But, but Jim, that's but exactly to, what's happening. But to your what point. You so it's yes. just a one year it, it, yeah. it, it, it's a jump to, to get to standard. Yeah, okay, so this, uh, this is a decision, a policy decision to get to standard. It's not like something is absolutely happening in that one fiscal year. Correct. That's correct. Correct. What we're, what we're trying to show with this, and we, and we show it in this slide with nursing psychological guidance, is that in order to get back to what we've defined as standard, there's a big jump in FY15. The same is true in special education support staff, a big jump in 15. And, and in fact, as we go through these, um, for a number of these, let me just go to um, a slide here. Here, here. And then, can, I, can, I yeah. can, can you take the microphone? Just, just maybe this is a, a pointed way of asking the question. Sure. Um, there's a big jump because you want to get to standard, and I understand the policy reasons behind that, but essentially the override, much of the override is related to this decision to get up to standard, is that, would that be a fair way of characterizing it or is that un unfair? We've, we've chosen to bring you numbers that do both of those. So if you, if you look at this chart, which is page 24, we've actually broken this out to try to show, if you look at regular education staff and special education and ELL staff, which are the areas that we've tried to staff appropriately as we've grown over the last nine years, we believe that the growth for FY15, we need somewhere in the neighborhood of a million three to hit those numbers that we listed. And then we've given you the, the growth we expect in the next few years. We then separately broke out the numbers in regular education support staff where you are correct. There's a big jump in the first year. The same is true in the special ed area, a big jump in the first year. And the same is true in what we call program enhancement building support. And what we're, the point we're trying to make is we believe we've fallen behind. And we believe that in order to get back to what we've defined as standard, these two numbers, the million three and the 3.3 together, yield this $4.6 million number. Uh, Jim, and it would be, it. yes, a policy decision to try to do that, and it would be a significant override to fund that. Okay, uh, and I understand that fully, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate the thing that's gone into that. I guess the question would be for this committee, would it be uh, outside the purview of this committee to say maybe we could take more modest steps over a longer period of time to get there, or is it absolutely necessary to do that in year one? I refer to the boss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just know how I handle budgets when I go to my board sure. and they say, I say I want a big jump, and they say no. Sure, and, the issue, and, and part of the issue here, Jim, is that's what we've been doing for five-plus years. Yep. We've been making a set of commitments around the classroom. If you go back to my budget message over the last five years, you'll see that our resources have been focused on the classroom, maintaining those class sizes because we believe that was the best investment of limited funds. Could someone take this and say, let's do a different approach? Let's come to the standard in these areas? Well, let's take a look. Let, let's, let's be more, more nuanced. Let's look at some of them and say, that needs to go to standard now. Right, these are areas that have been neglected too long. There are safety concerns. There are issues around student IEP, whatever it may be, whatever the, those, that other standard may be, and take a look at some of them and say, for others, we may need to look at them over a three-year period or whatever. Of course, of course. And we could certainly take a look at these within, within those, um, those uh, uh, that kind of a framework as well. And um, the, the 4.6 is in addition to the million dollars that we saw from Sean's slide. This, yeah. this is about enrollment, and Sean's slide was about so, a structural deficit. So in your, if I could have everything I wanted basket in order to resolve the structural deficit and bring you to the standard you need, we're really talking 5.6, which so, would be so enrollment I, growth and getting to the standard and covering the current 
deficit. So I'd prefer to call it the, we, we, we've set a, a set of numbers on the table that help bring our school system up to the standard that we want, that we've defined. Well, I'm, not, I'm not arguing oh, I know you're that. Not. I'm I know just you're looking not. for the number. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so the number is 5.6, which would be the structural deficit I, without growth and without getting back to or up to the standard you think is required for, for the kids. And the 4.6 cap captures the enrollment growth. The, the 4.6 is the enrollment growth and getting back to standard. And if we add the one that's in there from Sean's numbers, it's a total of 5.6. So remembering that, that, that all of those are full of sets of assumptions. Right, right. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm right, adding it including up Including right a collective next. bargaining yep. assumption, right, that was in Sean's number. And they are separate from a, from a technology plan that we've put right. forward that will show to the school, we'll talk with the school committee about tomorrow night, and that we'll come here with in early December, um, yes, a rough yes. So I just want to make one small comment, which is that <clears throat> just about the wish list thing. I mean, I think there's a whole lot of things on a wish list that are not on right, here, that's if right. that's fair. Which okay. is why I tried to redefine it. That's fine. So I just, I just want to say that there are, I, I, we have um, had a fabulous, rich conversation about two-thirds of the way through your presentation. I'm wondering if you want to take us through the rest of the presentation, and then we'll open back up, because I think there are some things, as I'm peeking ahead, that we want to get to. I think you last left us at 18. I, I think I was here, wasn't I? At no, 19? Well, we or hadn't done 18. 18. Yeah. You hadn't explained what OTPT Right. Uh, the um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, and BCBA. The, the point here was the point that, that Jim was making, which was that, again, in these specialized areas, we were looking to bring ourselves up to formula. And I apologize for the 12 and the, uh, the 0.4 being in the wrong box here. They should be FY15. Um, and this shows, as it does in the dollars, that it's the FY15 growth going forward. Um, I believe there are two other areas that we wanted to review. One was administrative support, um, and um, this is what the superintendent was referring to earlier when we look, looked at a basket that included some central positions, two of which were restorations of positions that we previously cut uh, when our budget was so tight we couldn't afford uh, to maintain them any longer, our director of professional development and our uh, manager of data and um, accountability. And then we believe that as we grow at the elementary level, we'll need to grow um, some additional support, uh, uh, administrative staff uh, in support roles as well as at the high school. So we've added, uh, projected out over these years, five positions at the K-8 level and seven at the high school. Uh, as you see, this one does not have uh, a similar uh, large jump at FY15. Um, and then the data here I think is a little too small for you to read. Uh, but we wanted to combine them. But, but uh, just to give you a flavor of what we call our, our program and building support growth, um, we've looked at um, Steps to Success, which we believe is a program that over the course of the next few years, uh, if we're going to expand it, the services to a, to a broader population, we'd be adding to the staff um, our Enrichment and Challenge Support Program, which is under program review currently, and we believe there'll be a recommendation uh, to do a, a look at a different model and, as well as to do some uh, expansion to staff. In our educational technology, uh, we're looking at um, uh, moving out um, and expanding the base of our technology, which will require support services. So we've priced out some additional staff as well as some additional, uh, additional contracted services for professional development for teachers uh, to use applications. Uh, also, uh, we have a literacy initiative underway uh, that would, uh, if expanded at the scope that we would like to expand it, would require some additional staffing and contract services over the next five years, although this then phases back down um, and, and uh, ends, at least on, in terms of the contract investment, uh, with the staffing then backing down. And we're looking to um, utilize those staff to expand our mathematics initiative. Um, additionally, the uh, second grade paraprofessional model, uh, which would, uh, we believe, be a mix uh, of uh, reallocation from current one-on-one -on -one services and other areas within special education, uh, as well as some additional resources. Uh, and finally, uh, we believe that with the addition over the next few years, uh, either through construction, uh, through a mix of construction, uh, expansion, and opening the Old Lincoln School, we'll be expanding our footprint 
of um, uh, square footage, and so we'll have pressure on our uh, building services budget, our energy budget, our custodial budget, so a mix of services that we've priced out. And then we're also looking at uh, some supply increases uh, because we haven't been able to uh, adjust those budgets upward uh, significantly in the last year. So we looked, uh, we, we're looking at this as a 10% increase in year one and then a 5% increase in the following year. So that this totals out, um, that entire package in year one is another million dollars. So as I said earlier, if you look at how we broke this out, uh, we broke it out as projecting into FY15, a million three in what we call our basic uh, regular and special education and ELL classroom teachers, which is the area that we've grown as we've grown over the last nine years. And then uh, other areas of uh, program support uh, as well as uh, investment that we'd like to see putting dollars into that we've broken out. Yeah, and you can see that the total over this, uh, excuse me, um, over this uh, nine year period is a $15 million total uh, package. So I'm glad to take any additional questions. Race through that last third. Okay. <laughs> we'll just go around. Beth. So with the, the program support growth, I, I'm sorry if you might have said this. I just want to clarify. So, so this growth is also to support enrollment growth. This is an enhancement of these programs, or is it? Is you're, it you're talking this area here? I'm sorry. So the, point so is really acting up. Slide 22. Slide 22, yep. So steps to success, ECS, education technology. So uh, is, yeah. that, is that all enrollment related or is that enhancing um, the program? It's, well? it's a mix. This is a mix. I would, uh, you know, um, the literacy investment is a, is a different model that we'd like to expand. We probably would want to expand it without enrollment growth. The, the um, adding to our mathematics, our math specialist staff, um, is generally because we haven't, for the most part, kept up with those ratios. So while this isn't uh, timed exactly with enrollment, it's partly reflective of the need to, uh, if we're going to maintain the same level of service, to increase that. But this is a mix that partly reflects enrollment, but it's not based on the same ratios as the earlier package. But the growth of this over the years also um, corresponds to some growth that we're seeing in enrollment. So, uh, two, sort of two questions. I guess the first is if we're sort of going and talking about standards, which I think drive. I, I guess I was surprised how much of the 4.6 million first year is non-related to the, with the enrollment per se, but is support or admin or special ed growth. So I wanted to dig in on that a little bit. Are there other standards? Are there are there foundation budget standards we should be looking at in terms of nursing staffing or psychologist staffing? Because I'm assuming. You know, uh, Ed Reform created a, a foundation budget that was built on a very detailed formula. So are there other standards we should be looking to, not to disparage the professional accreditations, but they've got an incentive to have low ratios, right? That's I, I actually think that the standards that you'd find from Ed Reform are, are lower than, than ours. The, the Educational Reform Foundation budget is here and our spending level is here. But, but so therefore, can we, can we infer from that that sort of the backing into where at the detailed level at, at nursing staffing or other other staffing that you're sort of based on accreditation ratios or, or trade association ratios that the foundation budget would say that the nursing ratio in, or the budget based on the foundation budget is based on 700 students or some um, other is there some other uh, so if we're going to talk about standards are there other standards particularly state standards associated with with education funding that makes sense to look at the, most of the state standards that I've seen that are associated with education funding would not be, uh, I think, standards that we'd look at because, as I say, our spending and the state foundation budget are two very different um, conversations. Uh, but if you're, right, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying, if you're making the case that we should be funding a sufficient catch-up on nurses, or I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm just saying, but if you're making that case, should we look to, should we look to what the rest of the state does on that or what, what the rest of the state sort of foundation budget is built on? Understanding we spend a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah, Poplar. No, uh, I'll let Karen answer because yeah. she would know and I wouldn't. <laughs> well, actually, specifically on nurses, um, our nurses' ratio is actually based on um, data that our coordinator of health nurses did, which actually compares us to um, other districts in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And our ratios are way, way above all equivalent districts. So we can actually, I mean, I would be happy to sort of provide that data. It's not based on the state nursing association, it's actually based on 
what our districts in Massachusetts are looking at in terms of nursing to studio ra student ratios. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, uh, no, sort on, of. Go on, uh, go on. Thing. Go on. Se second question I had was, uh, I guess, on the um, on special ed support growth, where that's sort of, as I looked at it, it was sort of OTPT. Uh, wouldn't that, so there's, there's a catch up associated with that, which I'm struggling with, because I'm assuming that service is associated with an IEP. So if I understood the math correctly, there's sort of a ratio based catch up on that, but how can that be if those, if I'm assuming those are services that generally are, uh, are provided in, in conjunction with an IEP, so there wouldn't be an IEP related catch up that would happen in fiscal 15. So I'm misunderstanding that. So, you know, I think one of the things that um, when you, I, I think you made a comment that it's not related to enrollment growth. And I think where we're looking at catching up, it is related to enrollment growth. I think but, if, you, if you look at. But um, can I just, so on slide, on slide 18, so let me just be really specific, sorry. It looks like there's about a 13 FTE catch up associated with OTPT speech and BCBA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. services I'm assuming that are associated with special, with, with an IEP. Re, re, my own personal experience, that services related to an IEP, I'm assuming. OTPT and speech, and all of them provide services in what we call an RTI model, which is response to intervention, which is part of regular ed. But there's currently, in, in, the, in the current fiscal year, there's 34 people providing that service, right? So we're either massively underfunding that effort as it relates to uh, associated IEPs now. It's not IEP related, it's not related is what she's saying. Not, okay, sorry, it's not. Do you want to okay. just say it again, Dr. Schmuckler? I don't think that it's not IEP. Sure, so um, OTPT speech and BCBA, yes, provide mandated services to students on IEPs, but we also have um, what we call response to intervention, which is really around exactly what it says. It's preventive and it's services to students in regular education that maintain students, as students with support and services in regular ed so that we're preventively responding and actually keeps our numbers of special ed down. So we have not made any adjustments in any of those functions over the last number of years, either at, as our special ed growth has increased with enrollment and our regular ed growth has increased with enrollment. Does that, okay. does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, th I think what would be helpful for me, for me or for us perhaps is, is if you were able to make a list of the various um, standards that we're ta that you're, you're talking about, we are not at standard, mm -hmm. let us know what is the, st who's, de who's defining that standard? Is it a professional group? Is it um, our, our, our peers? Um, and, and that would be, I think, very helpful to see, to, because it's all, it's, it's within here, but I think it would be helpful to see the 10, whether it's nursing or psychologists or, um, or speech therapists, what, it, what the standard is and who d who's defining the standard and how low we are. And that, I think, could help us understand the importance of catching up and what that would mean. Is that, is that possible? Is yes, it is. It? Yeah. Sure. Certainly uh, for any of the assumptions within this package, for sure. Okay, Kevin. Yeah, I, I think Carol and um, Tim's comments are, are, are really great, and I just wanted clarification from the, from the chairs. Uh, my assumption has been that the various subcommittees that are looking at departments will be ascertaining what they think are the appropriate competitor communities with which we wish to compare ourselves whether it be for schools or for public safety, <coughs> and that those committees will be doing some of the questioning as to what is the appropriate level of staffing uh, based on what other communities with whom we are trying to compete and maintain our property values with. Is, is that a correct assumption? Yes. That's my, our assumption. Broken out these um, this this growth and these assumptions by special ed and regular education. Is there any place where one drives a need in the other, other than the things that we've talked about? Um, what you th tell me? So I, I guess I asked the question only because of to follow up on the on the point about the subcommittees. Mm -hmm. We have. Um, we've broken ourselves up into regular education and, and special education. And I guess I'm just wondering if there's any, where the 
where the interplay is, if there is any. Um, a decision that, for example, um, a change a change that you're recommending up here for special education that may have an impact on regular education that wouldn't be immediately obvious to us or vice versa? Well, I mean, an example, I, would, I would presume, would be something like the second grade paraprofessional model. You know, right. in, yeah. in a point in time when we'd be implementing a model like that, we would want to make sure that all the folks at the building, the child study group, as they're potentially looking from one year to the next and thinking about a placement, an appropriate placement of the child, and knowing that a student moving from first grade to second, if we're implementing a change like that, they understand that that model may be the support that a particular child would need, and so it could affect the decision. So the point is that, yes, at every school, program decisions are a very integrated kind of a conversation among the staff, and that they, by understanding what opportunities and resources they have at the building, are going to make different choices. So yes. There's always that that interaction between regular and yeah. special I, education. I, I, uh, so it's, it's a really why. great question, it's and and I, I don't know how you actually break them out, right? Particularly in the in the in the world that we live in today. I mean, Karen gave you an example of the of of RTI and looking at some staff that people normally look at and say, oh, that's special ed, and and we say no, no, it's really not. A, a number of the people in that area, um, growing numbers of people in that area, are in a preventative model. Um, and, and your special ed services are really only as good as, as what you do in regular education, right? And so th there's, a, there's a great interplay, and I think it's very difficult to actually separate the two. Is, is it worth sort of thinking through, there are a number of interventions that the school committee and the superintendent have talked about which um, have implications across the two, though, and it might be worth trying to think we, we, we talk about them in piecemeal, but if the question is what is the interplay, there are things like the landmark partnership, there are things like class size, there are like there are a whole host of things on the policy front that one can sort of make un, sort of understand from both sides of that. So anyway, we, I don't, we don't have to do it standing on one foot, but there is a, a list of them that the school committee regularly talks about. I guess I'm curious that. Um, I'm certainly aware that the town has worked hard and the schools have worked hard to try to look at special ed costs and work on controlling those. And I would imagine, again, I'm not an educator, but I'm hearing that many of the staffing deficits that are being suggested here be made up are pointing towards the idea that you would be able to further uh, better or control um, the special education requirements, hopefully putting more children back into mainstream classrooms and so forth. Those would reflect, I think, important potential savings. Um, and as far as I can tell, there has been no assumption so far in the budget presentation that would point in that direction. A am I misunderstanding this? Can you try me on that again? Go All right, so yeah. if the notion, I think, has been that we are trying to control our special ed costs, right. that and, part of, and part of that is preventative models, right. models right. which try to identify children earlier on and put perhaps more specialists in the classroom at a young age, and that some of the staffing deficits that you're pointing to are directed towards uh, improving those ratios and increasing your opportunity to carry out that concept. In theory, if they're effective, they would seem to then translate into lower special education costs downstream. We're looking at 10-year projections, and I'm just observing that I don't yet see the potential that is being offered by seeing reductions in the budget in other areas. So as we spend more here, we're making an investment which presumably has a payoff. And I'm just curious about that part of it. The, um, so, so the, I'm sure there's a question there somewhere. I'm, I'm sorry, Sergio, <laughs> but here's, here's what I mean. Here's what I want to just go Let over. me ask my colleagues, do, do they understand well, the I question? Understand the question. question. Yeah. I'm happy to I, restate let, it. Let me, let it's a good question. energy efficient. You want payback in the future. I get it. No. Here, here's all of us. Yeah, I'm asking, <laughs> is there a yeah. payback I believe in your there, opinion? I believe so. And, and to the point that Karen was making earlier, 
the, in the two areas that actually grow the most in terms of, of staff, if, if these are for this program called response intervention, uh, which is more of a regular ed intervention in this category that we've called special ed support. And to go back to an earlier slide, um, where we look at um, guidance, that, again, it's the guidance, the psychological, um, where the, the biggest growth to standard and nursing arises. Those are, in many ways, services that can be and should be provided outside special education. So to the extent that both these two categories increase staffing in these areas to the extent that they can support students in the, in the regular mainstream, if you will, to avoid growth in special education costs downstream, the answer to your question is that's what we would want to see, yes, yes. But, but I'm asking I, I whether you've tried to yeah. show us that. You're showing, for example, let's go back to the question let, that Jim. Let me, can I try, it's just real Sorry. soon. It, no, no, we, no, it's not there. No, those projections for what this, what additional savings the second grade paraprofessionals will bring to the mix of what we've done, we think, we think that, that that'll happen. Um, we projected it when we introduced the K-1 program X number of years ago with the school committee. Um, we've not projected what that, what that savings might be. We've not projected what RTI saves us in terms of a lower percentage of our students in a growing student body. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be on, on, on uh, um, we'll, we'll actually need an IEP. Um, we've not projected some number of the classrooms that we're talked about over here are not learning centers. They're, they're district-wide programs that will allow us to retain more students in district and bring other students back. And, and we've, not, we've not made those projections here at this point. I, mean, I, I fully understand and appreciate that there may, in fact, it's possible there is no savings, that it may be that we'll have better, happier students who are more successful in their lives and their futures. And it may also be that it's just that you've been able to control a cost by holding it steady rather than seeing it increase. Well, so and that's I'm, indeed what I'm happened with I'm not suggesting the, an answer. Right, I'm right. just I'm testing the question. That's exactly what happened with the PARs. I mean, what we showed you X number of weeks ago here was that we've grown by X number of students, right, and yet our paraprofessional staffing essentially remains the same. When the trajector, trajectory it was on before we put the K-1 model into place would have driven quite, quite some number more. We've essentially held that number the same. So is that a savings? We think it is. Well, I think the out-of-district cost was the other piece. Yeah. Right. Number, out-of-district placements and as a percentage was the other place. And this, so we've... Uh, so there's the, services? Right. So, so right. I think what, what we're seeing is a, a constraint in growth right. over the last number of years as these things have been. So what we haven't done is said, for example, out-of-district is a great one. So if we had grown at the same percentage in out-of-district placements as we had in enrollment growth, what would that cost increase have been? Is that a savings? Kind of. Um, but it's it were essentially the, the raw number has held steady, more or less, in the 85 range, even as our enrollment has jumped 30 percent. And I don't know what the average cost of an out-of-district placement is, but they range between 20 and 100,000 per. So eighty thousand. So an average of eighty thousand dollars per an out of district placement. And so what would a growth from eighty five students up thirty percent multiplied by eighty thousand each? I mean that's a way to uh, calculate a savings. We don't. We. Don't, I mean the district doesn't do it that way. We certainly could go back and say what would para growth have looked like had it kept pace with enrollment. What would out of district have looked like? So it, it's a it's a backwards looking way to do it. I just, I don't think anybody would want to bank on those numbers. Right, but can I speak to how we actually yeah. will do it? To, uh, now that I understand the question, I apologize for, for misunderstanding. We, as we did these projections, we, ex we basically didn't then back out factors that could be affected. But as we, for instance, put the FY15 budget together, if the pattern holds that we pointed to in our projection, in our conversation a month ago where we said we're beginning to see some stability in the special education growth number. The number that Sean carried, remember he said it was this 478,000 plus a number that was in the town side that was a total of 750 which is the projected growth as we sit here today as we're looking at 15. We would hope to get and actually I do hope by the time our FY15 budget is together and Karen's going to kick me for this. I'm hoping that our growth in special education will be less than that 750 number that, that has been a, 
a, a target that we've set each of the last few years because we've been so concerned about that growth. We said we have to grow this or else we may find ourselves in de deficit mode. I would hope we could build a budget for FY15 based on the experience that, that uh, Susan just spoke of in terms of the number of students we've managed to bring back and some other changes we're seeing, hopefully, that, that we're, while I may not affect year one, we may have to make decisions around how we fund the enrollment growth, but hopefully we can control, if I can control the pointer, yeah, <laughs> hopefully we can control the special education growth as we build the FY15 budget. That's the, the point um, I wanted to make. So, so I think that's the question you're really asking us. Yeah. yeah Can I, I your question? Yeah. Okay. I, I think it would be really helpful Sorry. if to get as, uh, as good a guess as you can at that number, because it's sort of like when Sean was presenting the health insurance, mm -hmm. um, there was a huge swing between if we went this way and instead we have the savings from GIC and we're looking at some really big numbers that are really scary. So to the extent that we can make them less scary, it, it, it would be very helpful information to have. No, I understand. Other as I was saying earlier, we're just getting into the FY15 development, and, and we have a lot of work ahead of us. Other questions? Please. Lee. Just a, maybe I've missed something in this, in this discussion, but the, the various catch-up items that you have identified, the, would, these would exist even if there were no enrollment growth. Is that correct? So shouldn't we be analytically, shouldn't we be separating those out from enrollment growth in terms of, of what of well, the drivers? Been, well, I think, yeah, go ahead. They've been created, they've been created by the enrollment growth. They've been created by the enrollment growth that we've experienced. So um, uh, they've been created by the fact that we've chosen to devote our resources to the classroom and, and not to adding on to our elementary guidance staff, as an example. So I, I, I believe they've been created by that, by that growth over the last five to six years. I think maybe, maybe just to sort of rephrase Lee's point, they're, they're, they're created by past yes. enrollment growth, right. and we're talking about other things that are created by future enrollment well, growth. Well said, yes. yes. So that's, that's right. That's, so it, may, it might still be that we should be analyzing them separately, but they're... The aha uh -huh is, um, is yes, I, th I think we should be doing that because it's, um, I would be interested in seeing what the number is to, to, to make up, I mean, at some point, what will the number be to get us ba based on the past enrollment growth, and then what's the number, what will the number be for the future enrollment growth? For everything that we're talking about, I think that would be enormous. And, yeah. and I think I think that's I think that's it's largely easier. here. No, it's just we'll yeah. be jigger. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, But but we can also try to provide some standards and some clarity on what our standard was, which is what you asked before. Are there any further questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. This is All right. Don't don't get up yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter, Sean, Bill, Karen. Very helpful. Thank you, Karen. We have not really alerted subcommittees that there would be reports. I mean, the recent, I mean we have the, the meeting. Right. So, so our next, so this is for the, the next couple agenda items are um, other business, um, which I dare anyone to bring up, and, <laughs> and subcommittee updates. There wasn't a specific thought behind subcommittee updates, meaning we don't need to go around one by one and have everybody update us on where you are unless there's something particularly interesting or important that you want the full committee to know. Um, remember that we're going to have a bit of a hiatus for town meeting and for Thanksgiving, and so our next full committee meeting will be on December 4th. 4th. Uh, there will be, there have already been subcommittee meetings in the meantime, there will be subcommittee meetings between now and then, um, and so I guess this is just more of an opportunity if there are, are things that people want to alert each other to, important questions that you're raising or discussions you're having, um, it would be great to let each other know. So the floor is open if people do want to to do that sort of thing. If you're bringing in somebody out from outside who's important, that sort of thing. Lisa, um, you can take a microphone. 
the capital subcommittee, um, the decision was was made that we would have HMFH in to speak to the capital subcommittee specifically because we have very detailed questions that we want to hit them with, and we're going to submit them to them in advance and and try to make that a very um, very hands-on working session. Uh, but I want to make sure everybody's aware of what, when that is because I know there was interest among the larger committee to attend that or to, to hear what HMFH had to say. And uh, that meeting is going to be on December 5th, which is a Thursday from 7.30 to 9.30. Thank you. And while it's always fun to bring our town <laughs> staff up every week, um, we don't have quite so many opportunities with external uh, consultant, so thank you for that. Heads and I just wanted to add to that that on behalf of the capital subcommittee, I'm trying to coordinate the questions for that architectural team in advance so that they have a chance to prepare. And I would suggest that if other committee members have questions, that they might be directed to our capital subcommittee chair. We will turn, give them the search. <laughs> <laughs> Any other committees that want to? raise meetings that are on the docket? Give any updates? Beth, the, the, the take a microphone. Pro oh. The school programs task force will be meeting with Bill and Peter again on Tuesday to go, n not so much necessarily into these projections, but to understand um, in, in further detail the, the spending priorities and, and some of the, the things that have been considered to be to cut in the past and, and also to talk about class sizes. Um, so if there are any either follow-up questions for today or questions on those specific subjects, you can send them to me for us to address. And, yeah, and just um, one final uh, point. Uh, the school committee is meeting tomorrow. Th that was alluded to. What will be discussed at the school committee meeting tomorrow? I gather it is a budget discussion. Just budget? We're doing budget tomorrow? It's a budget guidelines. Am I missing yeah. budget guidelines and directives? Oh, oh. Yeah, I, I believe they were put on the docket, but I don't believe there's going to be a first reading. Is that correct? I don't correct? think yeah. they're doing that. There is that technology yeah. presentation, but the, but the discussion, and I saw it on your, on your agenda or on your list of meeting dates, the discussion of the budget priorities um, won't happen tomorrow. It'll actually, the first reading will be that first meeting in December, <laughs> which I want to say whatever that first Thursday in December is. So issues that might be relevant to this committee. The technology plan. Okay. So Thank this you. is the is technology operating or capital or both tomorrow? Yes, both. both. Okay. Uh, the other thing that went out was, is there a CIP update or is that not happening? That is not happening. CIP is not happening. Um, that'll also. happen after it's so, heard by the Board of right. Selectmen. Um, it'll happen at the school committee meeting on, I, I believe it's December 4th. Right, just in case you guys see it on the, on the website. Um, do, Sergio, there was a conversation. Do you want to, should, somebody should talk about the um, demographics? I mean, what, what uh, you guys are doing because. Of our own Jed Farnbeck. Did I say that name correctly? Um, on, uh, oh. uh, in house Jed Farnbeck um, next Wednesday at 5 30. Um, we are still trying to chase down every single number to reduce uncertainty um, in, the, um, in the numbers, and we intend to invite. Assessor McCabe and someone from the school department to take a look at those numbers. Um, I think we have our game plan in the Democratic, in the Democratic, why do I keep doing that? Um, in, um, in the demographic uh, subcommittee, and that is to reduce the uncertainty of the numbers so that we're really solid going forward. To that end, we're also, of course, taking a look at what housing stock is and the questions that that, that brings up. Um, a, big a big discussion is how the cohort stays the same uh, from year to year. So that exciting reprise will be next Wednesday um, right here at 5.30. Mike, do you want to do a quick, oh, just what municipals are up to? Uh, sure. Um, we had a meeting, uh, the, the uh, municipal subcommittee had a meeting yesterday um, with both the fire chief and the police chief to just uh, go over their um, general operations and their organization. Um, we continue to, to gather information from various department heads and, and we'll be probably going back to them with more detailed questions about their, their budgets and operations and staffing um, as follow-up. Yeah. And you all have seen on the couple tab articles about some of the revenue discussions on pilots and other uh, interesting revenue features. I don't know if there's anything in particular from revenues to raise other than that. 
fiscal policy is having a robust debate about discounted cash flows, which we absolutely do not <laughs> need to go into, and real and nominal, real and nominal growth rates of, of money, um, which we're not going to go over. Anything else? Anybody else on the committee? Have I forgotten anybody feeling unloved? I mean, the one question that I've heard and, and we haven't really talked a lot about, but is sort of calibration among level of depth of the committees. Um, so that's something I think that as you guys get into the next set of meetings, you'll just want to think a little bit about. I've gotten a couple questions of, are we literally just asking the questions, having them come in for an hour, saying, yep, that sounds about right, and then kind of moving on, or are we kind of going down to the $100,000 level in every one of the budgets that we're, that we're contemplating? And so, you know, there's certainly a March 1st answer versus later, which we've talked a lot about. And um, so you all will have to come back to us and, and talk to us about calibration um, and how, how you're thinking about that question, because it will be a little bit different subcommittee to subcommittee, but at the same time, we don't want one subcommittee going all the way down to the $15,000 level and the other subcommittee saying, yep, $20 million budget looks great without much depth there. So we do want some type of calibration, and the committee will have to make a decision um, as a whole as to how we do that. So. Um, I'll just put that out there and we can revisit it in December. Thank you. What else? Any, Lee, last comment? Just a question. The, the meeting on the 19th, what, what um, of the school program subcommittee, what, 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 can someone review the planned agenda for that, that since that partially conflicts with some town meeting? That was that. identified as Peter Rowe and Bill Lupini re-spending priorities including class size, which I gather is one of the issues that's being discussed at the school committee meeting tomorrow. No, that was taken off the agenda for tomorrow. No. The budget guidelines and directives? Okay. I mean, how will, so that, it's, how will that differ what, what, uh, what we talked about tonight? Uh, maybe, maybe he can spend a few seconds just clarifying yeah, so, that. I, mean, I would imagine that we would go into further depth to understand what the, the trade-off is. If, you know, if we don't do this, then you know, what is the implication and to really understand, you know, beyond just the numbers. I see. Okay. Um, programmatically, what does that look like? I'll try to be there. Yeah. I mean, that that is the meeting that uh, is currently scheduled for room 408 and uh, yeah, right. the question is whether it can be moved to the high school because town meeting is at the high school that night and yes. a number of committee members. Yes. And Bill has said they're yes and they're working on finding a room. Good. Great. Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Thank you all. <clears throat>